Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having us on stage. Um, today, we're going to talk about CodeShop. Uh, I'm Chris. I'm a partner with Molten, and we led the Series B round. But since we invested, a lot, of has, a lot of has changed. So the question for me is, how did you initially come up with the idea of CodeShop? And how has coaching changed? And then we jump a bit more into the expansion piece, which is the topic of today um, around the world in 80 days. Yeah, thanks for the question, Chris. And thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, it feels like yesterday, but in fact, it's four years ago that it was my brother, Janis, and myself sitting in his living room and um, dreaming out loud, I would say, and um, both with a track record of an entre being entrepreneurs for the last 15 years. We said, you know what? Life is too short to do something that is not meaningful. So what we said is the next big thing that we want to commit a significant part of our lives on that should be building a good business. And what does building a good business mean for us? On one hand, of course, it needs to be commercially good, good unit economics, good market potential, good growth potential, plus at the same time doing something good, doing something with a purpose. And that is actually what coaching means for me. Um, I know some of you might have uh, experience with coaching. For myself, it was definitely life-changing. When I was a first-time manager 15 years ago, um, I was coming freshly out of university, and I was completely overwhelmed. Um, you learn so much great stuff at university. At most uni universities, you don't learn how to manage people, how to manage your stakeholders, and I didn't even learn how to manage myself. So, that's when my coach helped me to really overcome my challenges and to really become a better version of myself. And as Janis and me were discussing four years ago, we said, you know what? Coaching is so powerful. And every top executive, every top politician, every top sports person, they all have their own coach. But why is it actually that only 0.01% of the global workforce have access to coaching? And that's when we said, okay, this is what we want to change. Let's democratize coaching. Let's make it accessible for people of all career levels worldwide. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Today, you're considered as one of the global category leaders in that space. Tell us a bit more about the experience of when you initially started, how companies or corporates uh, talk to you, what they perceived, what coaching means, and today, right? So I'm sure that was a very interesting journey with lots of experiences uh, down the road. But just share a little bit how this actually evolved. Yes, happy to. And I mean, when I look in this audience, what do I see? And maybe do this, look around, look left to you, right to you, behind you. What do we see? Individuals, different dreams, hopes, fears, challenges. And for hundreds of years, corporates would support their people in having one-off classroom trainings. Oh, no, now you're a manager. Now you have to do this. Oh, now you're being promoted. Now we want to have this career program. Now we want to have a transition. Now we want to digitize. Now we want to have a cultural change. And you know what? It doesn't work this way because we are individuals, because we want to be addressed with our own needs and our own opportunities to really unleash our own potential. And that is actually what we are helping our clients with. And side note, yes, also new talent generations ask for this. It's not so much about, OK, who's driving the fastest car or who's earning the biggest paycheck? Nowadays, it's about personal development, growth, and purpose at work. And uh, for the first time in history, technology, AI, video conferencing, all this information are helping us to scale something as unique as coaching, which in the old day was only uh, uh, available to the executive throughout the entire organization. And that's what we're doing, really helping our clients. Most of them are, are corporates, really the, the who is who from Toyota, Fujitsu, Saint-Gabin, BNP, Paribas, Coca-Cola, Twitter, you name it, to scale coaching across their workforce. So tell us a bit more. So initially, you started off in Berlin, so with a very strong focus on the German-speaking market. 
But then obviously you acquired a, a player in France uh, last year, which obviously put you into the European leadership uh, in, in, this, in, in, in this industry. And so now you're going after the global um, category leadership. What has changed, not only in terms of organization, but also in terms of the audience that you're talking to? Are you talking now to the, the head of talent development in the big corporates, or is it still more local divisions that you're talking to? How, how has that changed? So let me take one step back. When I was a little boy, I always wanted to go into international politics. I wanted to become a diplomat. I actually, my grades were not good enough to, to, to go in this direction, but I studied law and, and did a little bit of work for the government until I realized, you know what, there's too much politics in politics for myself, but I still want to change the world. I still want to work in a very, very international setup. And that's when we said, you know what, If the public sector is not the right space, then let's go to an environment where you can create your own future and where you can actually shape this, this future. And in coaching, the wonderful thing, something is possible which is not possible in politics. A world without borders. We're having a global network of 3,500 coaches worldwide from over 80 nations coaching in any language that comes to any of your Uh, your minds and this is really so rewarding because all of them collaborating all of them sharing this vision of making people's life better transforming careers transforming entire organizations and really building the future of people development so maybe quickly on your on your question on global category leadership um, I think many startups and many founders in Europe limit themselves Maybe that's something we've been taught at school or taught by our parents. No, stick to what you can, play it safe. And um, it took us a degree of craziness, I would say, to really launch this business four years with a very clear plan to build the global category leader in digital coaching and roll this out across the world. And I remember the very first weeks when we started the business, we were still two people. We looked at Wikipedia, what are the 20 largest economies in the world? And we said, okay, let's go there and let's help them and let's really transform those, <laughs> those organizations over there. And that's what we did. We started uh, 2018 in Berlin, uh, where I'm born. Um, half a year later, we opened our UK operations, our French operations, our Scandinavian operations, Benelux. Eastern Europe, Southern Europe, um, one and a half years ago in the US, North America, where we have 130 people, Latin America, Middle East, uh, we have our APEC HQ in, in Singapore, um, we opened up our Shanghai uh, office quite a while ago, two or three weeks ago we opened up our office in Tokyo, and then in Melbourne, Singapore, we have another 30 people. So 850 people from I believe 50 nations, I would say, We have the United Nations right under our roof at, at Coach Hub. Um, and that's really uh, rewarding. It's really been in 80 days around the world. Um, what was the craziest experience uh, on that journey? Which country in particular stood out? I would say every phase as an entrepreneur has its challenges. I would say maybe the most challenging moment was even getting the business started. At a, at a period of time where uh, my wife was pregnant, I was in a stable job, and really to making this move as an entrepreneur to this uncertainty. No paycheck, you don't know if your business is going to fly or not. That was probably the biggest challenge to get uh, started. And then the ride over the last four years, that was just, uh, just incredible. And um, I think you know very good because we are collaborating since you let our uh, series be. Um, but in four years, we did seven funding rounds and um, to really bring this business global and asking about what was maybe one of the tipping points and a game changer for us, that was in fact when we acquired um, the leading uh, player for digital coaching in France, which was the second largest uh, digital coaching platform in Europe called Move One. Uh, end of last year and you significantly helped with this transaction a um, hundred wonderful people in Paris and um, bringing about 80% of all French corporates as clients that was really a game changer because all of a sudden 
we grew into this position where we were the unrivaled number one here in Europe. And it sparked this idea of, no, why is it always the big US tech startups changing the world and coming here to Europe? Why is it always Amazon, Google, Facebook and the like? We here in Europe can do so much more. So we really said, okay, even more now than ever, let's build a global player with the European DNA. Yeah. Um, look, I think you, you mentioned it already, to, to go international and to expand quickly, you obviously need to have a lot of capital on hand. Um, you, you raised 330 million to date, and just uh, a couple of months ago, you closed one of the largest rounds in Europe of 200 million. Um, how has the market changed compared to last year, and how, how was that fundraise? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a huge number, and, and how did you sort of convince the parties who joined the journey? So, in a nutshell, um, I can honestly say I'm very glad I have a very good coach who supported me on the way, because it was, it was very unexpected. And um, we're leaving end of last year on a back of very strong Q4 results. We said, you know what? It's going to be a walk in the park. January, we go out. Six weeks later, we're done. So instead of this expected six weeks walk in the park, it turned into six months of walk through constant fire. Um, I think it was a quite intense phase for all of us. Um, but the results uh, were really strong, really worth all the efforts. And I'm very grateful for, for my wife and family and my coach and the entire team and our, our incredible investors to <laughs> really support this journey. Yeah, no, I think I can echo that. Um, looking a little bit into the future, so obviously now you're sitting on a lot of capital. How do you deploy it? What's the deployment plan and what are the next goals that you have set for the organization? Also in the current market environment, obviously, which is different. Yeah. Obviously, if you look at today's market, it's not the time of blitz scaling. It's not the time of coming up with crazy ideas we want to roll out across the world next year. At the same time, I am a firm believer, if you have a dream, then follow your dream and don't switch your plans every now and then. I remember when COVID hit, uh, two years ago, so we were having intense discussion uh, in the board, and many, many investors out there said, you know what, you need to completely change your pl uh, plans, you need to cost cut, you need to reduce your headcount, and we were having these discussions, and uh, it was actually my brother, Janis, my co-founder, who mentioned, you know what, let's keep calm, let's stick to the plan, clients will come, and eventually, turns out, COVID, we saw um, actually a very strong tailwind, Many, many organizations realized, you know what? You're doing coaching 100% digital. In the old world, I've, I thought that wouldn't be possible. But now I've run my entire organization remotely during COVID. So I understand that this is the future. And um, I know today's situation is not a health crisis. It's a financial uh, crisis that's different. At the same time, I still say, let's stick to the plan. Let's be reasonable. Let's make sure. The business is fully funded in any case. That's a priority number one. I've learned my lessons the early days with other startups. Um, at the same time, yeah, also keep planting the seeds. So we keep growing in developing markets. We keep growing in, in, in Asia Pack. We keep investing and we heavily invest on one end in the sales side as well as in the product side of things. Because a challenging market situation also always is an opportunity. Um, yeah. No, I think th that makes a lot of sense. Um, the other question I have is, so I know that you internally always look at the 600 largest companies in the world. So tell us a bit more about this uh, matrix, which is probably new to a lot of the audience here. Um, why is that so important? And how did you decide, or how did you make the decision initially to move away from SME and really focus on those large enterprise clients only, which is basically what you do today? And then the second question is, how did it help with expansion, right? So landing those clients is obviously a bit harder, but then how do you expand them over time? Yeah. So. I mean, I can tell you when you're two founders in a living room and you're calling the sea level of Daimler, it's a hard sell. Um, it took a while. <laughs> At the same time, why did we take the different approach instead of like the typical startup approach? You work with 
SMB, then you go to mid-market, and then you go to the enterprise level. We did it completely the other way around. The reason being is because we identified this incredible market opportunity. And if you look at trend agencies, if you look at the Gartner hype cycle on human capital technology, they are predicting 100x growth in the space. And they're predicting any major organization to implement a digital coaching solution at scale by the end of the decade. So that's a massive opportunity. And even though I'm sometimes joking and say my brother Janis is the guy with the golden nose because he can smell nice business opportunities, I doubt that he's the only one who was smelling this opportunity. So we said, okay, we need to be fast. And corporate clients are, yes, they are the most toughest to crack, but they are also highly rewarding. They are very loyal. In uncertain times like this, where many companies are cutting their budgets, we don't see this with our corporate clients. They are long-term planning. We're supporting our large corporates with topics like their digital IT transformation or their culture transformation. And these are things and projects that are set up for 10 years. And what we are seeing is that our satisfaction score, we're measuring NPS for all our personas, it's at 70, which I believe is, is, is pretty nice. It's actually higher than the, than the Apple NPS, which means that our clients, employees love the Coach Hub Coach more than Apple fans love their iPhone, yeah. which also results in quite nice uh, stickiness and retention rates. But this shows that the full focus on the top clients is so critical because this phase is a land grabbing phase. And um, no matter what's going on in public markets, in 10 years from now, the market shares are being split. Now is the time to actually gain those. And that obviously explains why you so aggressively internationalized. Um, Today you're, you're in Japan, you're in, in China, you're in India, you're also in the US. Tell us a bit more about the US. The US obviously is the, the largest market with, I think, 225 out of the 600 largest companies in the world. What's the strategy for the US? How do you actually approach this, this huge, uh, gigantic market? For us, in general, our internationalization strategy is basically we're following our clients. When we started the business, we started from day one working with the large clients. Those large clients are typical multinational. Then we're following a land and expand approach. That means we're working maybe with one local entity in Central Europe. Then we're rolling out use cases. We're rolling out across geographies. Um, I know this leading um, e-commerce uh, companies, now they do a lot more stuff as well. They started in Central Europe, rolled out across the UK, rolled out then across North America, China, India, Australia and the alike. So that led us to also build our coach base globally. And then we said, you know what, we're having people being coached in all those geographies. We have coaches in all those geographies. There's a huge market okay, maybe we should also build a sales force in all those geographies. And that was for us the, the starting point. And if you look at markets, of course, Europe is a quite developed market. When it comes to coaching, the US is still the most mature market. And then Asia-Pac, it's a giant uh, a greenfield. Yeah. I mean, you already mentioned on the, on the demand side, obviously, a lot of the younger generation um, potential, high potentials, they're asking for coaching, right? So this, there's very strong tailwinds. Tell us a bit more about the supply side of things, right? So obviously there's coaches out there, but you need to make sure that the quality is right, that they live up to the standards that you want to represent on the platform. How do you ensure that? And, and also, once you expand in a country like India, are there enough coaches who actually have the same quality compared to the US, where this might be a bit more advanced? So when you talk about coaching, I'm pretty sure anyone here in the audience would agree it is a big thing. And probably everyone has considered coaching. At the same time, it would be very hard to find a common definition what actually coaching is. What does it mean? It's a non-regulated industry. So that's where we come in. We say, okay, let's really create these principles. Let's really create these standards. Let's really make sure that we are focusing on quality. Because many of our clients would go to Google and they can promise you the first hits on Google's, they're probably great at marketing, not so good in coaching, most likely. So um, that's why we're building the, this, uh, this, this global pool, this global community. Um, actually, our acceptance rate to become a coach with CoachUp is 5%, which I understood it's harder to become a coach with us than to get into MIT. So 
Um, I, uh, I take this with pride and the majority of the coaches is, is exclusive with us. Um, uh, but it's really, it is, it is an effort to really heavily invest to build a value add, not only for your clients, but also for, for your partners. Yeah. And, and you were asking about uh, geographical differences. It is very different. If you go to France, generally, the organization setup is much more hierarchical. So this needs to be catered into in the product. If you look at Asia Pacific, uh, Japan, for example, there is not a word for coaching. The word training also covers coaching in these regions. So there's a lot of educational work to be done as well. Mm -hmm. I know that you have a very scientific approach to this as well. So there's lots of science with Jonathan Passmore. You're one of the leading uh, coaching experts in the world. Tell us a bit more about this lab that you actually built and, and what are sort of the, the learnings that you derive from it? What we realized early on, when we really want to grow big with our clients and really want to support them at scale, we need to prove the impact on what we are doing. And impact can look different for any client. If it's, um, if it's a de diversity, equity, and inclusion use case, it's probably different measures that you would look at than when it's a, a change project or a digital transformation project um, or anything alike. So we are working closely with our clients, and that's where our lab and our behavior scientists come in. We pull them in with our, our key deals and work together with our client to define how does success look for, me, for you? How can we measure success? And then to deliver on it. We're not signing up a client unless we jointly identified how success looks like. Because then we can come back in a, in a retro and say, look, these are the metrics you wanted to measure. We're having some scientists and some researchers in our, in our own ranks. And then we can show you this data. Do you want to roll this out? Because if you're talking about multi-million budgets, typically um, an executive level is involved. And typically, organizations want to see some kind of impact or some kind of RI. Make it measurable. Yeah. Um, that brings us to the last point that we, I wanted to discuss with you. So obviously, the current product offering is, is already serving a lot of uh, people. But how do you actually expand that? And what are sort of the next things, the big things on your roadmap? And are they also driven by some markets like India or Japan, where you might have different requests? How, how do you look at this? And how is that actually shaping the roadmap? So last part of the question first, how does the product offering differ, differ by market? And um, best example, for example, is uh, France, um, where we were having a tough time to enter the market. And I believe it wouldn't have been possible without the merge with the category leader in, in France. One key learning is because the market is more hierarchical, we've developed a feature to involve your line manager. So our coaches in France in the first session can loop in their line manager where they giant, jointly align on the target of the coaching and then the two individuals can have their coaching session. And this kind of features we're then taking and rolling out. For example, in Asia Pacific, we're seeing some similarities, and companies can benefit from the same, uh, uh, same features that we're developing here. And this is, I believe, one of the advantages of coming from a European nation, because actually there is no one European market. Europe is a combination of many, many different nations. They have different languages, as we, as we all know, different cultures, different uh, philosophies, different approaches, different regulations. And this early need to adapt also makes you quite flexible as an organization. And that's probably what gave us this competitive edge over some US players that grew up in a very consistent, very big market. They have no need to adapt. And once you have a huge business running in the US, would you really implement this sm small feature? Because in Finland, you have a specific requirement? Probably not. Um, yeah. So the, what it really means is that the international markets have an impact on how the product will look like in the future. Um, tell us a bit more about the executive coaching piece, because that's something that you're working on. Um, how big is that opportunity, or is that actually going back to how it has been in the past? Executive coaching is an interesting one, because it's actually one, one step back to the roots of coaching. So as, as we know, in an old world, coaching would be accessible to the 0.01% of the workforce, just the executives. What we're doing with our core offering is really making this available for a larger audience. At the same time, I have to admit, until we've reached our vision to democratize it, meaning for everyone in the workforce, it's a long way to go. Um, we still have to work on new features. 
there is something coming up. I can't say anything yet, but maybe maybe in next year's uh, uh, time um, to really address the whole workforce. And while we're working towards a solution to address the bottom of the pyramid, we've also developed this little feature to, develop, uh, to address the small executive level as well, because oftentimes they are the sponsors. And if you get the buy-in from the executives, if they feel the power of coaching, they are very likely to also roll it out across their business line. Famous last words, we're coming to the end. Thank you so much, Mati, for sharing some of your learnings uh, that you gathered in 80 days around the world. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening. <laughs>